when I was a kid growing up, you could have your shelf after shelf of comics, but there really weren't any great toys to put in front of them. We developed shows completely without thinking about toys. Networks bought shows. Toy companies were not involved. The creative impulse came first. You know, we had characters that were created f specifically for storytelling reasons. Uh, characters like Firestorm, characters like Superman and Batman were all created to have stories told about them. In 1969, uh, Mattel had been developing the Hot Wheels toy line. A Hot Wheels cartoon show had simultaneously run commercials for Hot Wheels toys. Well, a lot of parents and consumer action groups got really upset with this because they said, this isn't just a cartoon, this is a 30-minute advertisement. So the FCC decided they're right. And the FCC had come down so hard on whatever company it was that made the show and whatever network it was that put this on the air that as far as the animation world was concerned, as far as Saturday morning was concerned, there could be no connection between toys and cartoons. So in 84, the Reagan administration deregulated the children's television with the FCC. And what that allowed was for there to be more of a marriage between cartoons and toy lines. And the toy companies decided that since they could come in and not be dealing with networks, they could finance the shows themselves. They could create a show that would be based on a toy line, and then they would, you know, they would get the show placed in syndication. This was very much a time when there was that synergy between the toy companies and the animation companies and other media was really starting to come together. And so suddenly now there was this huge influx of toy money directly into the syndicated marketplace. I've always felt that the that the content needs to lead in cases like this, that if you tell good stories with good characters, kids are going to want those figures, as opposed to saying, oh, we want this figure, so put him into the show. DC and Kenner had worked out a deal in 1983 to produce a line of action figures with a specific logo on it, that Super Powers logo with the stars and so forth that wasn't used before. Super Friends had been on Saturday morning for a long time already then, and had, I think, drifted somewhat younger in its perceived audience towards the end of the first season of Super Friends, actually, that the Super Powers line started. And it was an interesting mix of characters. Kenner, in their testing, want to go with something that sounded a little tougher. And in particular, their line was designed around the fact that the characters could exhibit their powers. That was the radical selling feature inherent in the toys. The fun thing about Super Powers at the time, you had Jack Kirby redesigning some of his characters for the toy line. You had George Perez working on some of his characters for the toy line and it really brought the two worlds together in a way that hadn't been done before. The fact that you go to Perez or Kirby to create things that ultimately become toys is the right way to go because they're the ones that have the most passion for those looks. I cannot tell you how stunned I was with the notion that I could f obtain a Dr. Fate action figure. How is that possible? I, that never would have occurred to me growing up, and then there it is. To be able to watch your show on a Saturday morning and then go out and actually play with the stuff. It was a really exciting time. What was really cool about that line was that they came out with everything. I mean, you could get any character that you possibly wanted. They really wanted these to be true to the character, and they spent a lot of time in the sculpting. They spent a lot of time making sure all the details were right on the figures. Up until that point, most of the toys, the Mego toys, were very similar. Before superpowers, the existing superhero toys were mainly either solid figurines, like the ones turned out by the Marks Toy Company, or they were the Mego dolls, which were very popular in their own right. By the early 1980s, the technology of production of them with plastics allowed you to do two things that were fairly revolutionary. One, it allowed you to give them superpowers. And they were flying off the shelves every time I went to go get one back then. You had Superman with fighting arms, you had Flash with running legs, Aquaman with swimming legs. Robin would throw his karate chop and Brainiac would kick you. But it's a power. And second, the production runs were really coming down in size. So you could now do an assortment where you made a lot of Superman figures, but you could also make a few Dr. Fate figures as part of it. The Superpowers collection was released once a year, three consecutive years. The first wave consists of 12 figures, and it covered pretty much the basic superheroes that DC Comics had at the time that everybody knew. As the line progressed in its second and third incarnations, in the second and third waves, the powers got more interesting and elaborate, and you had, you know, characters whose torsos would whirl around in a cyclone effect or what have you, and that was pretty cool. The second year, you had, you finished out the roster with the characters that everybody would know outside of the Big 12. By the time the third wave 
it was being sent out to stores, the line had already been canceled. Some figures such as Cyborg had just barely made it into production and so had the lowest number of figures of that character reach stores. I look at it to say um, these are things that that I grew up loving so much and the fact that they actually got that they got made into a toy validates my belief and my love for that character. They've only gone up in value over the last 20 years. A cyborg typically can go from anywhere for $150 to a very beat up played with copy to over $400 for a perfect mint, never opened out of the package version. 1986, moving from Texas to Los Angeles. I have 32 of the figures. There's 33. Now I don't have Cyborg. No one has Cyborg. Finding Cyborg in Toys R Us is like you stand a better chance of finding a Loch Ness monster in Toys R Us. Can't be found. Driving along Lubbock, Texas, in the middle of nowhere. There's a Kmart on my right, and I just, I knew. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I just knew. We passed a bunch of other stores. We passed a bunch of other places. I just, in my cyborg sense, was tingling. I pulled in the lot, much to the chagrin of my very cynical passengers who thought I was wasting their time, walked in, walked to the toy department. You like dolls, amigo? Take your pick. Found my cyborg without any problem. It was on a peg right there, just waiting for me. I didn't have to dig, it was right there. Walked out with a cash register, you know, everything's set, get back in the car, big grin on my face, and then for the next 10 hours, it was just me with a big thought balloon over my head with a picture of Cyborg in it. I was the happiest boy on earth.